Uh, your point earlier today, there is no such thing as a secure computer, and yes, the biggest problem in computing is people, and so a degree in psychology has helped me both in investigations and auditing, uh, but especially when it comes to uh, taking a look at some of the problems. <coughs> I have a son who works for Intel doing uh, what people might know as McAfee, uh, and sits on one of the Sims projects for that. Um, what I want to talk about, and the reason I have this somewhat controversial picture up here is I want to give you some perspective, okay? Um, these people believe that they were secure when the invaders came, and by the way, we are those invaders. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is that uh, they thought that they'd be safe, and here we are 200 years later, and they were wrong. And I think that today <coughs> many people believe that um, Cyber has problems, um, but I'll tell you further that um, what's going on in the cyber community is that we are completely overwhelmed. Uh, and you heard about big data and so on and so forth. That's just contributing to the issue. So the conversation today is going to be about the convergence between physical security and IT security or cyber security. Basically, um, I grew up as a physical security person. I uh, worked for a little known company called J. Crew. I was their first corporate director of security. I worked for Barney's New York. I worked for Honeywell International, the number two person worldwide uh, for security operations. Um, all those skills that I learned, and I spoke to a guy earlier today, all those skills that we've learned on the street are great, but if you don't have a cyber insight, if you don't have some certification behind you, you're gonna have a harder time finding a job. And as a certified fraud examiner, uh, and I can show you copies later, I actually have a slide. Um, some of the jobs that are out there today for people at my skill level are, and they're asking for it, do you have a CTP, which is the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, Physical Security, it's actually called the um, Certification for Protection Professional, but it means physical security. Um, but they're looking for other stuff. CISSP, anybody in here have a CISSP? Anybody ever heard of it? Excellent, okay. Uh, I'm studying for it right now, hardest exam I've ever taken in my life, okay. Um, the reality of it is is that corporations today don't wanna have a head of physical security and a head of IT security. It's complicated by the fact that the people in IT, how many people are in IT here? Strictly IT? Well, they don't wanna handle guards, locks and alarms, okay. And the people in physical security are not up to snuff for the most part, Right, the majority of them are not up to snuff on IT. So we have a problem here. The conundrum is that there's 1.1 million jobs open today that can't be filled in this country. Simple as that. How many people in here speak another language? Okay, more than one, more than two? Okay, more languages you speak, the more you know about other cultures, the better off you are in this field, especially when it comes to cyber, because not everything is typed in English. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this um, I'm going to go through this pretty quick here. Um, I'm supposed to have 50 minutes. I don't know what's going to happen to the gap here, so I'll do my best to cover it all. Uh, I'm going to talk about finding convergence. What is the convergence that's going on and why? Physical security versus IT. Currently, what we traditionally think physical security is versus what we traditionally think IT security is. Uh, related security functions, there is blending. An example is uh, CC tel CCTV or closed circuit television. Um, they're using analytics and so on and so forth for the last 10, 15 years. Um, so they're tied into our computer systems. We're gonna talk about threats, we're gonna talk about the risks, we're gonna talk about the needs, and we're gonna talk about the opportunities for your careers. It's as simple as that. As a loss prevention person, an investigator, law enforcement, a uh, certified fraud examiner or a CPP, if you get the IT skills behind you. Um, I'm gonna show you there are, there's a corporation out here right now, they're looking for a person that has those skills, starting wage, 165. Don't raise your hand. Does anybody in here make $165,000 a year at their normal job? Yeah, I guess not. Yeah. Most of us don't, okay? I own my own business and I struggle for that too. Okay. Okay, so let's define convergence. Simply put, um, we're emerging distinct technologies. All right? When we say technologies, I mean the physical world. In 
investigations, auditing, surveillance, so on and so forth, investigate, uh, interview and interrogation. Those are the people that are in the physical security, IT, <coughs> security world. Then we have the IT devices, and these are just examples. Everybody knows that HR collects data on you, right? You fill out the application, uh, and they have HIPAA and some other things that are supposed to be protecting that information. Remember what I said, and you'll hear me repeat it. There's no such thing as a secure computer. Actually, I'm building one right now. Uh, that every time you turn it off, the operating system evaporates and you have to use a stick to restart it. That's the only way to keep people away from doing my investigations. All right, so these are the different, some of the different areas, types of information. That's the definition. A maybe more simplified definition is this. A smooth transition of one or more technologies or one or more types of work that blend together pretty well and uh, put it in there, it says the transition is in your future. How many people in here have taken computer courses? Okay, about half, right? How many of you feel, um, and you're gonna hate my next question. How many of you are 30 or under? Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> well, that being the case, <laughs> you're gonna love my next statement. If you're 30 and under, you probably are a native speaker, okay? Those people who speak another language, Mandarin, or I see many Asians, uh, that is your original language, your native tongue, all right? In computers, it's not my native tongue. I'm an immigrant. I'm learning another language. My son, and forgive me for the use of the word, my son says to me on a daily basis, uh, Dad, what are you, retarded? You know what I mean? I'm like, really? He says, it's just an iPhone, Dad. Just do this and do that. Well, I had my first computer when I was 36 years old. I had a Macintosh SE, and my son sat on my lap, grabbing at the mouse. He took his first computer course at three and a half years old. Wow. He was reading at two and a half. Okay, smart kid, gets it from his mom. <laughs> <laughs> He's Japanese and Spanish, by the way. Smart girl. Um, so, physical security. Isn't this what you think of when you think of security guards? Right? Typical, right? It's probably not as well dressed. Okay? You look around, the guard industry is one of the lowest paid industries in the world when it comes to security. And what is it that they're protecting? That's Every, stuff. Assets, stuff, people, and so on and so forth. Really? You're paying them ten dollars an hour to protect you? Anyway. So Protection of assets, supposed to be protecting people, property, profits, uh, our reputations ultimately. I mean, uh, you know, you pick up a newspaper and you hear that uh, Psyche, uh, and Nike is having a problem with manufacturing overseas somewhere because they're not following some guidelines, right? It's about reputation because with a good reputation you make more money. So this is what people typically envision security as. So, some of the basics about physical security are very similar to what you learn if you go into cybersecurity. Is that uh, we're concerned with uh, physical measures, and we basically are building the onion to keep things away from other people, whether it's the building or the outer office, and so on and so forth. Um, these defense perimeters provide an opportunity to defend the corporation, um, but these are also used in similar ways when it comes to information. You know, we have routers and firewalls and uh, antivirus and so on and so forth. But um, the equipment that we use now has become more and more digitized. I'll show you some examples here. All right, more and more digitized. So over the last 20 years, the cyber world has been creeping into the security world. All right? Unfortunately, physical security people haven't really taken that to heart and started learning a lot of cyber Thus, we have a shortage of people that we can use to do some of this needed work. This is a great photograph. Who wants to tell me what's wrong with this photograph? Okay. It was taken. It was taken. Who said that? Nicely done. Yeah. Well, you're right. But that it was taken, and, and probably from a drone, right? It's something we didn't have 20 years ago. Uh, think about it. They put this gate in the middle of there so they probably have some form of access control all right and so what happens how many of you have forgotten to take your id badge to work with you okay and so what do they do 
They drove right around it. <laughs> so all the money and the time and expense, and again, this is a problem, maximum security entrance, right? Uh, this is a problem, uh, and there's a greater problem here because I worked on a case years ago uh, where a rather large retailer had a situation like this, but they didn't want to put a fence up around it because they thought it hurt his status. Right? Uh, they don't exist today. Okay, simple as that. All right. Now, was it a security issue? I'm sure it was a combination thing. Anyhow, so physical security officers, generally when you think of security, you think of officers, you think of cameras and uh, CC, close circuit television, you think of fences and patrol, <laughs> locks and keys, background checks. How many of, how many of you work a full-time job? And have, did they do a background check on you? Yeah. Can somebody define what a background check is for me? Everybody doesn't differ. Uh, right on the mark. Every cult, you know, look around the room here. No two people are dressed the same. We have different cultural differences. We like different colors and so on and so forth. And that's the way corporations do the background checks. So there's no such thing as a standard background check. Uh, becomes a little bit more standard if you go into the government because the government has some really rigid standards. Okay. But private sector, it's a disgrace. Okay, so we're supposed to be doing background checks, executive protection, uh, investigations. The bottom line really is, and we talked about audits in the first presentation, the bottom line really is what we're talking about in physical security is access control, right? Control of the facility so that they don't get to your information that's important. security, cyber security, um, well, do they have guards? Uh, maybe more along the lines of investigators, analysts, okay, and they have engineers, who by the way build the software and build the hardware, all right, um, and you heard mentioned in the first presentation that um, there has to be um, a way for them to connect because they're not, you know, they're built individually for their own purpose to make money, and now uh, we'll talk about TCP IP, which is the language or the, um, the controls that's used for a computer to speak to another one. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the point is, is the engineers build it what they want. Software is turned out. It doesn't have enough security hardware, same thing. Does anybody know what firmware is? Anybody ever heard that term? Yeah. What you, what, what's firmware? It's proprietary internal. You, go ahead. Yeah. Um, it, it's the opposite of open source. Okay, well, uh, inside every piece of hardware is a line or two, of, for lack of a better word, it's an oversimplification, uh, is a line or two of code. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, that allows the hardware and the software to talk together, okay, or talk with other hardware. Um, so this is what our cyber people are working on. And by the way, interestingly enough, what are they trying to do? Other than make money, that was mentioned earlier, it is access control. They're trying to make sure that people can't get in on what they've just <coughs> done. Okay. Um, so I give this presentation to high school groups that are uh, involved in IT security, um, involved in law enforcement some of the tech schools. I've lectured here at Rutgers quite a bit, both here in New Brunswick over the last 20 years. And uh, I put this out there because, you know, today we have down the moon, we have satellites that have traveled, I don't know, hundreds of millions of miles and stuff, all because of two bicycle mechanics. And so what I propose to the students, and maybe even to yourselves, is uh, maybe we need a better internet. Maybe we need a different internet. Um, but we won't know that until someone comes up with the next idea. And, and I gotta tell you, um, I have a 17 year old who I mentor. I mentor 15 students, some of which are Rutgers students, uh, from high school to PhD. Um, I have a 17 year old who has a quarter of a million dollar business running right now, right? Three weeks ago, he signed a person for $80,000, uh, paid a year in advance, all right, for his IT work that he's doing. He graduates high school in six weeks. Okay. 
How many of us owned our own business when we graduated high school? Mowing lawns, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, you're absolutely correct. Right. I did buy my first lawnmower for twenty nine dollars, and I shoveled too. Uh, but if two bicycle mechanics can launch us into the the aviation age and into space age, really, all right? Who knows what might be done with some of the young people we have? And you heard again earlier in the presentation. I think the doctor hit it right on the mark and says, you know. We can't even imagine what's going to be going on in computers in the next 20 years. Okay? Imagine what we thought. My father was born the year that that kite took off. That's really what it was. Okay? And he lived through the 70s to see us land on the moon. Something's got to change. All right? and, and I think that we have the ability to change it. Um, during the Second World War, we went from prop-driven aircraft to jet aircraft in seven years. Isn't that amazing? Okay. Now we've had computers since the 40s, really, but they've really been out in society since the 80s. Okay. So we're coming up on our 40-year mark. What are we going to do? What What can we do to protect ourselves? Well, the first thing that has to happen, in my opinion, is, and people that are smarter than me's opinion is, is that the average person has to be a little bit more cyber savvy. Okay. We'll talk about some of this. So um, we're capable of creating innovations when we need them. You know, the, uh, during the course of war, it seems that we come up with some of the greatest inventions. You know, um, what's the mother? Uh, what's the necessity is the mother of invention? Absolutely, is what happened here. Okay, and it doesn't matter who produces them. The bottom line is these are two of the top aircraft. This was the fastest fighter during the Second World War. Uh, that was propeller driven, and this is the fastest actually in the first operational jet fighter in the world. We did that, people like you and I. Okay. Today, we have these aircraft, and this is not the exact aircraft, but we have vertical takeoff aircraft that are fighters, right? We have satellites, we're building space stations. Um, again, do um, you think the problems on Earth are going to end up inside that space station? Sure, they are. Problems with cyber are going to be everywhere. Cyber touches everything. It's, cyber is like oxygen. It's everywhere, right? And it's around you and in you, and that's the way it's going to be. And if we continue to morph, but the security industry, especially physical security industry, is moving kind of slow. Okay. Um, these are uh, nine of the most, um, I guess, nine of the categories most frequently used uh, for malware, worms, whatever, attacks against uh, corporations. Has anybody ever heard of ransomware? Okay. Uh, I ran into a person last week, actually the week before last, uh, down in Princeton, works for an architectural firm, who told me that his firm actually got attacked with ransomware. They wanted $17,000, okay? And then they would give him back his information. Okay. Now, um, I belong to InfraGuard, which is an uh, uh, infrastructure outreach program for the FBI. And uh, the rule of thumb is we don't pay. You shouldn't pay because it's like standard blackmail. They're going to keep coming back to the well for money. Anyhow, so he went to his IT company and said, these people just got into our computers. We need you to get in here today and take care of it. What's it going to cost? And he was told fifty to $70,000. Raise your hand. Tell me what that man did. Paid the seventeen thousand dollars and had his stuff back in twelve hours. Okay. Now I think that's just the start of his problems. But the point is, is this going on in healthcare? Now, who in here sees a doctor on a regular basis? All your information is in that office. And imagine if somebody gets it. Now HIPAA says that you have to do certain things. You know what HIPAA is? Okay. But what is it? Okay, and it, and it only took five years to even get up to stuff, right? Um, I, I can speak from a personal experience. Okay. Um, prior to HIPAA and so on and so forth, actually when I owned my first company, uh, we actually started out as a hotline company for reporting theft and fraud. And then later on people said, well, we don't have a security department. No surprise, right? Corporate America, no security department. 
And so they say, can you investigate for us? And sure I can, I built my first company that way. But the point is, is that they get into the health, uh, they get into any computer that has your information. How many hundreds of millions of files have been loosed out on the internet? And by the way, you know that old saying about once it gets on the internet and never comes back, you know, you can't take it down? That's pretty true. Okay, it's out there in some form. So these are the, the areas that uh, generally are considered to be the 92% uh, uh, of the security incidents. Um, crimeware, that's the, the ransomware. Espionage, I mean, uh, look at what, um, what was his name? Uh, Snowden. Look at what he revealed to us was going on. Not just in our country, but around the world, uh, based on some of the things. Credit card fraud, number one fraud in the United States. If anybody needs a book on that, I have one. I can give it to you. I can send it to you by email. If you've ever had a credit card fraud take place, uh, it can be a, a rather arduous thing. A friend of mine from Ryder University wrote a book on it, and, uh, and we just give it out. But the point of it is it happens in the United States 10,000 times a day. 10,000 times a day. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, if anybody in here, I mean, does anybody have any substantial computer background, anything at all? Any certifications? Any training? Okay. Well, hopefully uh, some of this will make you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay. So I want to say a couple things here. Uh, this is a 2015 pie chart on uh, types of attacks uh, that were uh, noted on the, uh, by several several different companies use the same pie chart. But the bottom line really is these are the types of attacks. Um, I'm not gonna go into them all, primarily because I'm not an expert in those areas. As I told you, I'm studying. But these, you know, we know what malware is. We know that uh, denial of service, DDoS, denial of service attacks, you know, you just have somebody's uh, computer dial the phone number or go down to the computer a thousand times a minute. Uh, but ransomware is a big thing. Um, the targeted attacks, the dollars, <coughs> the dollars that we're talking and losses here, I'm gonna to talk to you pretty quick here. Um, but uh, the dollars are amazing, right? And uh, I usually show a, uh, and I actually have it with me, if we have enough time. I actually show people what a billion dollars in $100 bills look like on pads. It's amazing. And we're talking about trillions of dollars being stolen, cyber or fraud, based on the uh, Association of Certified Fraud Examiners expectations. Um, billions and billions and trillions of dollars being stolen through these methodologies and still with pen and paper. And some of the smaller companies aren't as sophisticated, don't have great computer systems. And we're gonna take a look at some of the stats here. Um, is anybody familiar with uh, Verizon? You can go online and get this, by the way, it's free. Uh, Verizon does every year, they do a data breach report, and, and look at some of the information here, it's pretty scary. All types of organizations are being targeted, we know that already. Uh, in 2014, $400 million lost as a result to 700 million records being hacked. And by the way, this is only based on the people who responded, right? Who's taking a statistics class in here? And we love that, right? But I know you do. <laughs> but the point is, is that statistically, we don't have sound data because they only had 70 organizations report information to them. There's how many millions of businesses in the United States? Okay, alone, not to mention worldwide. Okay, 80 percent of the penetrations are from outsiders, and that could be from Eastern Europe, Asia. Can even be a 14 year old kid, you know, who's just going through and rambling through, and for all kinds of reasons, whether it's criminal reasons or they're stealing information or destroying their high school records, whatever the case might be. 15% from insiders, which comes back to my point about background checks. Okay? Now, Snowden had a background check. Now, whether you like him or not, it's immaterial. The bottom line really is the background check didn't prove anything. And how many? 11 million pages of information? It's more than you've read in your, it's more than everybody in this room has read in their lifetime. That's how much information, okay? Uh, and 7%, and this is interesting, 7% is, uh, penetrations are in collusion. 
And uh, you heard him mention earlier about the insurance frauds that were taking place. The guy from the inside working with some peers and then what, seven, seven checks went to the same account up to seven years later or something. Um, it's amazing. So again, these are people problems, right? It's bad enough that we don't have enough security in cyber, and then you add the, you know, who, who came here, who's, who's working today and is actually on the clock at their business? Who's getting paid to be here? Yeah, my wife left me. Uh, but the reality of it is, is why did you get up this morning? You got up because you need money to pay your bills, okay? What motivates you? Well, these people are motivated by money too, and they're willing to take the shortcuts uh, and they're clobbering us, and I'll show you, like I said, if I have time, I'll show you what that actually looks like. Um, okay. Got a question? Go ahead. Sure, I'm sorry, go right ahead. You go back to your other slide, and I think it's a, a point. I love stats like this. Go ahead. They can be misleading. Yep, go ahead. 80% um, of penetration are from outside. Um, I think what's more important about a stat like that is the penetration is from the outside, but they compromise the insider's access. Oh, well, but, but, but it's, you're important, right. it's important to make kind of those distinctions. Certainly from security. Well, you're absolutely right. Let's talk about that. So, does it, everybody, anybody know what social engineering is? Okay. The gift to get. Right. Okay. I, years ago, I would get on the phone. Can't do it today because it is illegal today. It's not illegal back then. I get on the phone, I'm doing a background investigation, and I needed information about this guy who just wrote a check that bounced. Right, a couple thousand dollars. Pull up the bank. And ask Dave, hey, does he have that money in the account? Uh, no, he doesn't. And did he actually have that money in the account five days ago? Uh, no, he didn't. We can't do that today. All right. Now that's one form of it because they felt comfortable with me, but they never met me. All right. Uh, anybody familiar with uh, what's called a boiler room scam? All right. We are. You're a very knowledgeable person. I'm also camps. You what? C A M S. Uh, okay. Um, boiler room scam. 30 years ago, someone out in LA decided that they would, in the boiler room of an organization, they could hook up a couple of phones and they would start selling toner, all right? So I worked for a security company in the last five years, I won't mention their name, and uh, I'm there about four or five months and I come walking in and the young lady, my secretary, says to me, can you uh, sign off on this bill? I need to get it paid, they called. I said, sure, let me take a look at it. And I looked down at it. Toner, for, does anybody have a copying machine that uses toner for $650 a cartridge? No. Uh, <laughs> if you do, you need a new computer company. Okay, so, and, and the unfortunate thing about this is, then I look down at it and it says shipping, all right, FedEx, 120 something dollars. No way, <laughs> There's no, and not unless it went by, uh, you know, FedEx heavy lift, you know, take it out with a crane. Uh, so I said, this is a fraud, and she's like, what are you talking about? And it turns out, she's only been there five months. The week after she got there, someone got her on the phone and said, hey, do you need toner for your uh, machine? Uh, we spoke to someone, and she says, oh my God, I just had this conversation with my boss. He must have been the one you spoke with. And, and the guy says, what's your boss's name? She gives it to him. And, and uh, I don't have it written down. He was supposed to get back to us. I don't have it written down what kind of machine you have. Could you give me the machine? She gives him everything, and now we start buying toner. $6,400 worth of toner in four and a half months. Okay, amazing. Social engineering, to your point. And it goes on every day. Why do you think fraudsters are so good at what they do? They're great bullshitters. They can get up in front of you and, I hope I'm not doing that right now. Okay. They get up in front of you and they're like, you know, uh, you need to do this, or I need, you know, I can help you do that. I mean, there's a thousand scams going on. You're absolutely right. Uh, so these people take advantage of our less security conscious people to get in, uh, to get into our systems from the outside. But these people scare me more. I got to tell you the truth. Um, some of the biggest frauds, some of the biggest thefts I've ever worked, some of them were millions of dollars, were insiders. Um, they. Um, and, and it comes everything from construction schemes all the way through to credit card schemes. Uh, the insiders scare me the most. And then you add cyber to that. And think about it. They have access to everything. All that data that he <coughs> has, all that data, that's all out there. Everything is out there for them. And if they're cyber smart, 
and they can modify some of that data, and we don't catch that in our logs or whatever, right? The, paper, the proverbial electronic paper trail. Um, who knows what damage they can do? Okay. Um, I, I think the most important, I, you know, phishing is on the increase, and phishing is uh, um, one of the forms of sci uh, excuse me, of, uh, social engineering. But um, think about this: if you and, and I don't know what policies your companies have or don't have, but imagine if you get an email that says, you just won $50 million in the London lottery. How many of you people know somebody in London? Okay. How many have been to London? Okay. How many emails to these people on a regular basis? <laughs> Who in your right mind would believe? We're in Nigeria, the other one. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. that's, uh, what is that called, uh, 409, no. 409 scam. Yeah, I just had one of my PhD students write up on that. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. But but the point is, is that if you've never been to London, don't know anybody in London, who in your right mind is going to believe that we're going to give you 50 million dollars or whatever the money amount was? Okay. But what do they do? Most dangerous, most dangerous tool in the world. We hit enter, and we allow them into our world. What should happen is, if you see something like that, you should call your help desk and your help desk should sandbox it so that basically it's uh, the terminology where they actually restrict it and then they take a look at who's actually doing it. But abuse, abuse all that's pretty interesting, but take a look at this. The New York Times wrote 700 data breach articles uh, in 2015 versus 125 articles two years earlier. So do you think from a business perspective, cybersecurity is a problem and of interest to these people? Absolutely. If New York Times is writing about it, presumably the business, the upper business people are reading some of this. The question is whether or not they're willing to put the time and the money into it. And again, the professor earlier mentioned, does it make them profitable? And uh, you know, I worked in retail for years and they used to tell me when I put together my budget, um, realize that we've built into the budget five or six percent for loss. I really. Um, anybody in here own their own company? Other, I do. Anybody else? Okay, well, let me tell you, I own my own company and I don't build five percent in for loss. Okay? <laughs> it isn't going to happen. The smaller the company, the harder it is. Okay. Um, so, two thirds of the incidents. Um, were cyber espionage and related to phishing. All right, that's pretty interesting. Uh, and the question is really, what are they looking for? Uh, uh, and again, it's too much money for them, probably. 23% uh, of the personnel open phishing messages, uh, and 11% open the attachments. Okay. 50% um, open up the phishing email within the first hour. How? How? Uh, what was that? Pavlov's dog. You know? You gotta keep looking, you know? Uh, we really are, people are really the problem here, all right? The software people don't write enough security into it. The hardware people send their stuff overseas and then, then don't check it when it comes back, right? And then the dangerous tool, you know? We hit the enter button and everything happens. 99% of the vulnerabilities that were actually taking place through these breaches were patches that were available to corporations that they never put in, and these patches were available for the previous year, and nobody put them in. Uh, how does that make any sense? Most patches, as far as I know, patches are free, right? You know? But someone's got to actually take the time to download them, and it doesn't happen. What's the IT person doing? And then this comes down to personnel and expense. Is we have too small an IT staff. Maybe that's why security is a little bit more. We need investigative people to handle some of these things. Uh, and needless to say, I've mentioned it a hundred times, it's cybersecurity is a human problem. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of these. You can, you, you can read it, it's big enough. Um, the one statistic here that I wanted to bring out to your attention. Um, let's see here. This is uh, price uh, 
Waterhouse, um, basically giving us information in 2015. 22%, um, while employees remain the most cited source of compromise, incidents attributed to business partners climbed 22%. So think about this. Um, have you ever been in a company where everybody had to show their ID when you came in? Mm -hmm. And what do the big bosses do? Walk right in and out. Damn right. Walk right through it. We're talking about partner level people just doing whatever the hell they want. But whose jobs are they cutting? Ours. All right. Because they're not going to cut their own salary because they screwed up. Okay? So. Go ahead. I don't think they're talking about executive level here. I think they're talking about cooperative ben uh, companies like vendors and things. When they're talking you about think partners. so? Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about that. All right. And let's talk about what the professor said earlier today when we were talking about inventory and you're outside of these other companies. Are they using the same software and are they using the same level of security that they're doing? Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. And, uh, and when's the last time somebody went over and ordered them? How many orders do we have here? Do you do IT auditing at all? Anybody do any IT auditing? Okay, I, I would bet, and uh, I, I've, I've been with some big companies, I would bet that if we went out there and checked those partners that you're talking about, I'll bet you more than half of them are not in compliance with the same standards that your company is using, if your company is using that, okay? So you see part of the problem. But all the statistics don't mean anything when you're out of work. When a company, I used to, uh, one of the things I used to write for uh, my high school students is, uh, there are seven categories of loss. It could be uh, cash, cash instruments, it could be inventory, it could be property, so on and so forth. At the end of the day, no matter what the loss, whether a place caught on fire, act of God, theft, fraud, whatever it is, when the business is out of business, you're out of a job. Just simple as that. How many people know somebody in here who's been laid off in the last five years? How many of us have been laid off in the last five years? It happened, okay. And is it happening because they didn't like us? I don't think so. I think it's probably happening for economic reasons, all right? And a lot of those economic reasons are a direct cost relation to these situations that are taking place, not only in cyber, but in physical security related to what I mentioned about sparks. The people just come and go as they please and do what they want. And I work for a lot of closely held corporations Okay, um, slight twist here. So we're talking about people that are inside our organization, whether they're partners or otherwise. Um, anybody know all these people? We know the guy up in the top. You're right. Everybody knows him. What about the guy with the weapons in his hands? He was Virginia Tech. He was one Virginia of the Tech. college yeah, campuses, absolutely. and that was the guy from the news station. What's that? Isn't that guy over here the one from the news station? Yeah, from the news station. Absolutely correct. By the way, um, although he was let go from his job, he was considered prior to the events that were taking place that made him let go a good worker, friendly kind of guy. Was out of work two years before he came back, and then he did it on film. I'm sure some of you have seen that. Right? This gentleman had psychological problems. The school failed to deal with it, and so, so did his family. Okay, And so other families had it. Um, I'm a former military aviator. I spent six years in the Army. I went in as a mechanic, uh, working on Cobra gunships, and then my last three years after I made sergeant, they asked me if I wanted to fly, and I flew front seat in the Cobra gunship for three years. So these two guys are of great interest to in me, right? This guy is only a PFC, right? And he compromised tens of thousands of documents to WikiLeaks. This guy over here gave away information that I don't know if you're familiar with this. Anybody in here former military? Okay, the Abrams tank, the tank that we use in the United States has never been defeated on the battlefield, okay? Never, okay? They might knock the track off or something, but the tanks have not been completely destroyed there. This guy gave people the information that they needed to help defeat our tanks, all right? These are lower ranking people, all right? So now, to, my, to your point earlier and to my point, so we have people at the very top and people at the very bottom. We have people that are with us all the time, students, professionals who were vetted, background check, so on and so forth, and a gentleman who spent two years on the job and then came back two years later, okay? So if we can't protect ourselves against physical, right, 
physical threats, we really can't, right? Um, you know, the standard is uh, shelter in place or bone like hell. Uh, and nowadays they're actually teaching um, to take the person on if you have to. You know, they didn't teach that after 9-11 or some of the other last five years or so, they actually changed some of that. But these people, whether at the top or at the bottom, they have access to information, they have access to people, our greatest assets, you and I, right? And for whatever reason, they just <coughs> care, okay? So how do we defend against them? Who's got an idea? I don't have either, right? But I can tell you that we could have, with a little bit of better auditing, we could have caught these two guys, probably, we would have caught Snowden. I don't think we would have caught the psychological problem because I think that's going to be with us forever, right? And the same thing is true with this gentleman. Who would have thought that he's coming back two years later, live and on camera, okay? So, you see physical security and IP security right here. So what's it all about? It's about access control. Bear with me a second. It's about access control and who should have access and what should they have access to, when should they have access. You know, uh, if you have a card that lets you in the building, it only lets you in during your normal business hours. So uh, why would we give them access and how we give them access, all of it is auditable, all right? Everything can be audited. However, manpower problems, I see it on your head, you're right. Manpower problems or a lack of understanding by senior management has failed to allow us capture the data, or once we captured it, to utilize the big data or whatever data is out there to help us protect our company, our people, and our economy. Okay. <coughs> I love that movie. Anyway. Um, does anybody, have you ever heard asymmetrical warfare? Do you know what that is? Okay, anybody, who, who raised their hand said they were in the military? All right, um, you know what it is? Going across different lines. Um, yeah, and using smaller groups of people. Um, you might have heard recently we're sending 250 more special forces uh, to fight over in Syria or wherever they're fighting nowadays. Um, and, and the reason I bring this up is it's important. One person with a lot of knowledge can get into your computers and put you out of business. One person can come in and set off a bomb. Terrorism is asymmetrical. What it basically means is this. In the past, we take the British Army against the American Army and we fight, or you know, whatever it was. Large armies against large armies. It isn't like that today. People are not going to do that. The American people would not stand for another 58,000 men dead like we lost in Vietnam, right? Two Gulf Wars. What, 12,000? Less than 12,000 persons killed, but the number of injured has increased significantly. The point is this, small groups, not necessarily countries, but it could be groups of people from a country, like-minded, um, can do quite a, bit of damage, quite a bit of damage if they're after a particular type of information or if they want to do some damage to a company. And I'll give you a great example. Uh, there are some people out there that are uh, pro-animal, I'm with them, okay? I like that. One. The fact of the matter is, is that some of those people are extreme. There's organizations called ELF and ALF. Has anybody ever heard of those? Animal Liberation Front and the Environmental Liberation Front. Those people have burned trucks on uh, new car parking lots. They burn houses and so on and so forth. They tend to be a bit extreme. And they focus on retailers who sell fur, as well as other people. Um, so they're making their political statement with their economic unrest. And the bottom line is, is that if they didn't want to go burn a truck or a house or injure anybody that way, um, what else could they do? Well, they've been hacking into things we call hacktivism, all right? And they've been hacking into organizations and denial of service, you know, so that every minute they're getting a thousand phone calls or whatever the case might be. If it's not a phone call, it would be on the computer. The point is, is these people, whether it's out in, out in the battlefield, small groups of uh, highly motivated people or small groups of highly motivated people on the computers, the bottom line is they can do a significant amount of damage with little risk to themselves. Has anybody ever heard of TOR, T-O-R? 
Can you tell me what it is? Well, no, actually it was developed by the dark It was developed by the US Navy. Yeah. <laughs> and then they opened it. Yeah, and, well, it's sort of like Stuxnet. Once you put something on the web, everybody gets it. So now the bad guys use Tor. If you're not aware of what Tor is, basically, you want to hide your IP address, you put the Tor system in, which you can download for free, and then it helps you hide. It's not perfect, but it helps you hide your IP address from other people so they can't see you. Uh, developed by the U.S. Navy, but you're right, people do use it. I use it to get out of the dark web when I do investigations because I don't want them to know who I am. Right? And I have my son calling me and telling me, Dad, are you? Yeah, I love that too. Okay. Um, okay. So, I think based on what we said, um, and, and if you disagree, by the way, I'm happy to, to listen, so please. Uh, voice your opinion. I think it's obvious that physical security and IT security, uh, the responsibilities are converging, and we, as professionals, you know, maybe you're not a loss prevention person, you're not a cyber person, but if you're an auditor, you're really an extension of both, right? And you provide opportunity for both of them to play, make the place more secure. So, the expanding areas of security right now, all physical security, all cyber security, Risk management is coming into it. Years ago when I worked for Barney's New York, um, we had a risk manager that actually handled our risk. And then he got laid off, and they said to me, you know, we've had so many slip and fall cases, can you help us with that? Yeah, in the next three years we didn't have any that turned into uh, lawsuits, and uh, our insurance dropped by, I don't know, $400,000 for that year, okay? So risk management has become part of security in a lot of ways. Um, and by the way, uh, uh, there, now you can buy insurance about being hacked. I don't know how good it is, but I've heard people talking about it. Uh, business continuity, does anybody know what business continuity is? There are a couple of, say. Well, it's just, a, you put a program in place so that when and if bad things happen, you know, your business you know, has the capability to come back. And it can be any kind of bad thing. Any kind of bad thing. It could be, you know, a weather event or whatever, or a cyber event or what have you, so you have um, you have a plan in place, your business has a plan in place to recover. Exactly. As soon as possible. Especially yeah. important. For retail, I think we could probably <coughs> get by without paying uh, the car bill for a couple of days, you know, not make a difference. Um, but for uh, utilities and law enforcement and so on and so forth, absolutely critical. Absolutely critical. It's usually like um, disaster recovery slash business continuity. Yeah. They kind of work hand in hand. So you, you recover from the disaster and then the business continuity kind of takes you puts that process in place up front. Absolutely, yeah. How many of, when you go back to your companies today, ask them how many have a business continuity or organizational resilience is another word they use. Um, ask, ask to see the plan. If it's uh, under 100 pages, I'm, I'm gonna tell you it's not gonna function. Right. <laughs> That's my best guess, and I've written a couple of them. Uh, privacy issues, I mean, this is huge. I mean, when it comes to cyber, it's huge. So. Corporations are asking us to do more with less. Anybody disagree with that statement? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, you're all, how many of you are government workers? Okay, okay. And, and the rest are private? How many are students? Okay. Okay, we'll get you out of school one day. You'll get out there in the real world, <laughs> outside of academia. Okay? But, um, so, the need for profit improvement is, and you heard him mention it, the doctor mentioned it earlier, I thought it was great that he, uh, he zeroed in on that. It's about profits, okay? You got up this morning so you could make a profit for yourself and pay your bills. Corporations do the same thing every day. Just simple as that, all right? It's not, a, it's not anything complicated, okay? So, um, these areas of responsibility today now for cyber and for physical security are confidentiality, branding, reputation is big. Um, think about it, you know, you hear about people, they, uh, Nike, I uh, use Nike again, but, um, years ago they had a problem with uh, uh, bad wages and safety, fire safety violations at some of their plants. It, was not, it wasn't just Nike, it was a bunch of people. But the point is, it hurt their reputation, sales dropped. What did they do? They sent over auditors from the United States and they made sure that they were using the same fire safety codes that are applicable at the highest level in those particular countries because they don't, 
many of them don't have the resources to do what we have here. So branding and reputation, very, very important. They impact corporate profits, and interestingly enough, they impact national security. Okay, uh, do you remember uh, the president sometime back <coughs> saying, uh, we want you people out there spending money? Oh uh, yeah, because the more money you spend, the more taxes, et cetera, et cetera, more jobs are created, which brings more taxes, and so on and so forth. Um, so the preservation of our economy's strength is important overall. Oh, I'm not going to go into this. In fact, how much time do I have, Carl? You have until noon. Oh. All the speakers are no-show, so they're covered. Okay. Well, I'll have to ask more questions if you guys can ask more questions. Uh, okay. Um, we'll talk about it later. Okay, we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I should have brought my uh, cane and tap shoes with me. Um, okay. So um, this is just a, a breakdown of IT security components. Um, and, and, and I don't look at it strictly as IT security anymore. I'm looking at it as security, period. Um, and again, as I mentioned, corporate security doesn't want to pay $160,000 a year for an IT vice president and $120,000 a year for a physical security person. They're going to, they are emerging already. Um, when I was out of work a couple of years ago, I was looking for a job and two things came to light. Number one, they wanted me to have more computer experience than I had uh, and a certification preferably. Right? The other thing was if you're over 60, overqualified, and you're at work. Always do it. Uh, so get your collect your money while you're young, right? Put it in the bank. Um, so I, I decided to go out and start my own company. But these things don't change. And the smaller the company is, the harder it is for to do all this. Right? The large corporations have the manpower if they want to put the time and money into it. Small corporations, I'll bet you, half the businesses in the United States don't have any of this, or hardly any of it, other than maybe um, malware on the computer, and they've uh, shut down some of the, uh, uh, what do they call it, door back doors on their routers. That's about it. All right, so to take a look at this, and uh, it all looks like Greek to you, because most of you people said you didn't have any computers. But uh, I gotta tell you, it breaks down pretty easily. You know, If you understand what a computer's made out of, all the components, you understand what the router is, and you understand all that other stuff, then you just have to understand how they communicate. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that. So with the convergence, we're trying to create one system um, in a timely manner so that, and I'll give you a great example. Uh, if you work for a corporation and John Smith got laid off, it's Friday, right? And they take his ID badge away from him, but they don't tell security. So he comes in on Saturday to empty his desk. And what does security do? Let him write in. Let him write in, okay? So the question that I have to have is, um, you know, much like when we were looking at that inventory situation before, I don't know if you're aware of it, but let me just state something. Um, today, um, Macy's has a warehouse, all right? Some of the large retailers have a warehouse, but most of their items are shipped directly from the logistics control centers of the people they're buying stuff from, you know, whether it's Snoopy dolls or whether it's refrigerators or whatever. It comes directly from there. They've reduced the number of personnel. Well, the reality of it is, is that there's communication there. When we produce the number of personnel in most companies, security doesn't get told. The person comes in and we actually have another breach, another opportunity for breach. Uh, and the reality of it simply is all they had to do, because you don't need six people to know about it, all they need to do is when the person is taken out of the system, automatically generate an email to management or to security personnel saying, effective such and such time. And by the way, that can be done automatically. Software is there. All you gotta do is, John Smith is no longer with us, click, and the automatic thing goes out. But they don't even do that. Right? It doesn't happen all. And by the way, that's true in government as well as in corporate. Uh, okay, so we're looking for a unified network policy, and that's partly what I was just leading up to. There needs to be standard policies and procedures. And we have those in a lot of cases, but then our practices don't reflect those. 
The bottom line is we have a policy that says when somebody leaves, everybody gets notified immediately. They wait till Monday morning. So the policy and the procedures are there, but the practice is completely different. And how many of you are auditors? Have you ever seen that policy and the procedures are there, but the practice is completely different? <laughs> Again, human nature, right? That's where we make I, our bread. I hear you laughing up there, so you gotta be right on the mark, huh? Daily. Human nature again, all right? Um, so better coordination of security resources. If that guy was being let go, maybe you should have had, and you don't, maybe you know that the person is a little bit uh, upset or violent uh, or emotional, and maybe you ought to have security in the area. So why don't you notify us in advance and we can have someone in the area. We're not going to escort them, we're not going to embarrass them, we're not going to take them around, but we should be notified in advance. And then, once the person's out of the building, maybe even security could send out that email. Just a thought. Um, for forensics, uh, a lot of what, a lot of the information regarding thefts and frauds that I've worked on in the last five years has been all on the computer. No, I mean I write my notes on here, but then I put them on the computer. Um, the reality of it is, is that forensics investigations are not done by human resources, and generally they're not done by the computer IT department, they come to security or loss prevention or asset protection, whatever they're calling it, and they ask, you guys need to do an investigation, and then what do we do? We go back to them and say, hey, who do I need to work with in your department? Okay? It'd be easier if we just had access to it and we knew what to do with it. We wouldn't have to have another one of their people in there. And by the way, the more people involved in an investigation, the more likely something's going to go wrong, somebody's going to open their mouth. Anybody ever had a problem like that? Someone, loose lips sink ships, you ever heard of that? That's an old military thing from the First World War. Um, I try to keep, whenever I do an investigation of any type, I report to senior management. If it's a client, I report directly to them. Nobody else, all right? Because I don't want to get out what's going on. Um, since the company with compliance and investigations efforts, and uh, because we're more efficient, I think there's a greater return on uh, our investment. Um, corporate America um, doesn't always see it that way. They see, you know, how many of you uh, go out for drinks with the guys or the girls on Fridays and Saturdays around work once in a while, once a year, twice a year? When's the last time you invited security people? Yeah. <laughs> you see? Perfect reaction. Exactly right. Okay. Nobody loves transfer to our but that's okay because you're supposed to have a, a separation. Notice that he was being terminated. And so he, he was uh, an IT person. He put a worm, it was right here in New Jersey down the shore. It's got to be 10 years ago. Uh, put a worm in there that 30 days later the worm activated and clobbered their computer system, shut them down. They ended up going out of business or actually having to rebuild their business from scratch. Uh, so your jobs are at risk. Our corporations are at risk. Uh, and the corporations, with some exceptions, uh, are the foundation of our taxes along with us. Um, our economy is at risk, and you hear people talking all the time. Um, our way of life is at risk in some ways. You should take it from an international perspective. Uh, there are people who would love to see our economy fail. And by the way, if you're not aware of the reason I put this up there, uh, the new Liberty Tower, if you're not aware of their intent, they, they thought they could take down the tower, but they weren't absolutely al-Qaeda, uh, weren't absolutely convinced that they could. So they were about as amazed as we were. But the point was they were focusing on an economic symbol, okay, the World Trade Center. Do you know what the second uh, site would have been uh, outside of uh, what happened on 9-11? There was another site right here in New Jersey that was actually targeted. Anybody know? Yeah, labs. What was it? Prudential. Labs. Prudential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was Prudential. Yeah, Prudential was on the list, and, and I heard later on 
um, that they actually, um, now they run counterintelligence, but actually at the time there were some suspicions that someone was watching. But, you know, you're only paranoid if you don't get, don't get caught, right? So, who knows? But the bottom line really is on that, is that they're, if they harm us economically, right, then they harm us, right, I mean, right to the spirit of us, right? Uh, bottom line is that they also, um, they would love to militarily come to get us, but this was an asymmetrical situation, right? It was a small group of people, who, by the way, spent most of their time in New Jersey in the Hackensack area at the Gogo Bar before they got into those airplanes. Uh, anybody aware of that? Right? Um, and uh, what they were trying to do was embarrass us and harm us economically, and that's really what took place. So without overstretching it, I think that ultimately security provides us our freedom, all right, both cyber and physical security. Uh, so what's needed? Uh, you heard me mention earlier that there, a year ago, the government, our government put out that there are 1.1 million open jobs in the U.S. that can't or have not been filled, okay? Um, I just want to show you something here while I mentioned that. I went online today. I clicked twice, okay? The first one that came up is um, Deloitte & Touche. Okay. Eight pages of cyber jobs. <coughs> Eight pages, okay? New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia only. Eight pages of cyber jobs, Deloitte & Touche. Then I clicked again and I got Lockheed Martin, um, I got an accounting firm, I got a, a video organization looking for security personnel, IT specialist for InfoSec, all right, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, there's a company called MITRE, anybody, M-I-T-R-E, anybody ever heard of them? Yeah. Um, I met these guys a couple of weeks ago over at Rutgers by doing uh, some work over there. And uh, these guys hire IT people left and right. They do a lot of, uh, oh, um, let's, let's put it down to research. I guess that's probably the best way to put it. But it's IT again. And that's down at Langley Air Force Base. Uh, Department of Army is looking for people. Department of Navy is looking for people. Um, Alta IT. Um, let's see, General Dynamics. And here's one that specifically says CS, CSS, CISSP certification or other security clearances necessary, all right? Citizens Bank, this was less than two seconds of work for me, all right? And I've got 12 pages of uh, jobs just in cyber. And I just put in IT jobs, that's all I put in. Now, um, any one of you that had a certification could apply for one of those jobs. The other thing I wanted to tell you about is I went and I looked up what some of those jobs were previously, okay? An IT auditor, uh, 2016, 95,000 to 144,000, average raise is 4.7%, okay? That's an order. Chief Security Officer, CSO, 140,500 to 220,500 with a 7% increase. Anybody make it 200,000 here? We were, we'll be here, right? <laughs> Sorry. So hopefully I'll be the catalyst that motivates you to be that person. Uh, here's another one. Data security analyst, 113,500 to 160,000, depending upon previous experience. Network security administrator, 103,000 to 147,000. Information manager, 129 to 183,000, 6% increase over last year. And there, uh, some of the certifications that I've mentioned are uh, the CISSP, uh, CI, um, SM, CIS, SA, SA is in order. Uh, and, but there are others, Cisco certifications, Microsoft certifications, um, let's see. A VCP, which I've never heard of before, is a malware certification professional. 
the, these are the types of jobs that are out there. Um, you take your auditing experience, your certified fraud examination experience, your investigative experience, add a certification to it, you could be amongst some of the best paid people in this country. And there are only a million jobs open. I'm sure that you can find a job anywhere. Uh, I told you my son uh, worked for Intel, and this past week he called me and he said, my God, Intel is slaying off thousands of people. And I said, okay, well, what's the problem? And he goes, well, I've only been here like two years. I'm like, well, have you been told you're being laid off? He said, no. I said, don't worry about it. You're in the cat bird disease. You have an engineer, computer engineering degree. You have certifications. You work for Intel. You work for an international company before that. You went to, anybody ever heard of Case Western Reserve University? Deep school. My son, 30 days after he gets there, I swear to Christ, this is true. 30 days after he gets there, he calls me up and says, Dad, I've been invited to a party. I'm like, great. My son's a, he's a nice kid, but he's, you know, he's not a party animal. So I'm like, great. And he says, he follows up with, and they told me to bring my math books. <laughs> I grew up in the 70s, I had hair as long as you did, you know, as long as you have right now. I didn't bring my mask, even in high school. <laughs> it's a different world. Okay, uh, so let's see what we got here. Uh, so we talked about the million jobs. I guess Carl, that guy's not going to show up. Huh? Uh, <laughs> uh, anyhow, sort of, uh, ethical hacker, these are some of the others you should be aware of. Great opportunities out there, and, and by the way, you don't have to know everything. You know, um, I learned there's an old adage that says that a wise man knows he knows nothing. When I owned my first company, I surrounded myself with people who spoke multiple languages, had degrees and certifications. They did a fabulous job. I never lost the case in the 12 years I had that company. Never. And in my undercover operations, we only had one person who was uh, loaned. Uh, literally got found out because somebody in the client's office ended up blowing the case for us, but they paid me for the six months. You know, we pulled the plug out for six weeks. Uh, that's just the way it is. So there are opportunities out there. Surround yourself with the best people. Um, <coughs> corporate America is looking for these. I already told you that. We're no longer outsiders. Security is sitting at the table for the first time in the 35 years, it's only been the last four or five years, security, loss prevention, whatever you want to call it, is sitting at the table with senior executives and they're being taken seriously. Uh, and you're looking at better pay, and, and I know this sounds kind of lofty, you know, kind of hokey, but you can make a difference in your own lives, financially, in your children's lives, right? Give them a better education or whatever you desire. And in your corporate, and hopefully helping our economic situation here in the United States. Yes, please, I'm sorry. Uh, certified protection professional, I'm sorry. Uh, that um, when I was looking for uh, work uh, a year ago or so, uh, CPP was asked for as a physical security. It's actually called uh, uh, certified protection professional, right? Which is a physical security situation. But if you have that, or you have an auditing certification, or a fraud examiner certification, and then one of the cyber certifications, you don't even have to do the zeros and the ones. You go right to the management level, right? And that's what they're looking for. Those are the opportunities. Um, so there are real good jobs available today. And there, and I did this only because I found this on the web and I thought it was great. They're, they're everywhere. Every time. My son lives out in Idaho, okay? You know what he pays for his apartment? $700 a month. It's, it's as big as, what's that? <laughs> no, that's okay. So they're going to take it. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, that's exactly what I thought when I drove them out there. Have any of you ever been to Princeton? Yes. That's what Idaho Falls looks like. I blew me away. They have everything. There's nothing missing. I mean, they even have Carl's Jr. Those big burgers. And, uh, uh, but they have everything. It's really quite a nice place. And it's dirt cheap. Everything is electric. Uh, they have those big wind farms out there and stuff in the open prairies. Um, $700 a month. And he complained to me last month that he spent a whole $40 for electricity. I said, yeah? You, know, you want to take a look at my mortgage and what I paid for utilities last month? It's a beautiful thing. But you can, the reason, by the way, I'll just tell you why they're out there. There was a company called Nitro that was purchased by John McAfee, who used to own McAfee, which is the malware that you probably have seen on your computer. Uh, 
And the whole intent of staying out there was, and my son is part of this, he doesn't pay for health care, dental, he pays for his prescriptions, but there's a, a, a copay only, um, and so on and so forth, because they want the young guys, but they want them to work 40 hours a week and spend the rest of their time with their family, quality of life. It's, it's, and by the way, there is fresh air out there. <laughs> we don't get much up here, I guess. Uh, anyhow. What else? Okay, so um, if, if you are considering what I'm talking about, the first thing you need to do is pick up a book, and I picked it up, it's called uh, um, DCPIP for Dummies. Okay, you know they have that whole series out there? This is how all computers communicate. There's more than one communication protocol, all right? But generally speaking, across the board, 99% of the people in the world are using this, all right? And so transmission control protocol, internet protocol, the bottom line is everybody, every computer that you use is using this. Uh, that's how they communicate. Uh, it's agreed upon practices and policies and so on and so forth to ensure proper communication. And I have no idea. Yes? What is the name of the book again? Um, TCPIP for dummies. Okay. Uh, any Barnes and Noble, and take my word for it. it. It really does a pretty decent job in trying to uh, explain how they communicate. Because when I started doing studying for my CISSP, and forgive me for you saying it this way, it was like me trying to read Chinese. It just, it didn't click. I didn't get it. Uh, and I can read some Chinese, right? <laughs> my son had seven years of Princeton Chinese language school, and I practiced with him for that time. And then I took it myself. But the point is, is that uh, it just didn't click with me. So then I spoke to some people that are in the industry, and they said, why don't you start at the basics? This is the basic. If you can understand this, you can pass the CISSP and some of these other things. All right. So that's that's my recommendation for you. And um, further to that effect, um, the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. You know who we are, right? We have our local chapter, and with that, there are scholarships available, right, for people that are going to school to get their masters or whatever. I'm sure that they would help you if you're trying to get some certification. Um, all you have to do is ask. Frank, hey. Frank. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sir. Dot org for the ACFD. Uh, what did I put? Our, our oh, I put dot com. New Jersey, I mean, New Jersey has a website. Those. Uh, so. ACFDNJ.org, but that's the uh, national. The national, yeah. okay. So New Jersey has a chapter website as well. Uh, the uh, ASIS International, that's their headquarters. Uh, but they have a New Jersey chapter, and I used to sit on the board, uh, and we used to give away $500 to $1,500 to any student, high school, that senior that's going into law enforcement or cybersecurity, college, whether it's a master's or a PhD, several of my students have gotten this money in the past. Like, if you want it, if you think you need the money, call me, I'll try to get you on there. 250 words, which you can type out in about three minutes. Um, and uh, get yourself on the list, and if there's money available and you're more needy, we'll get you on there, okay? Uh, ISACA, I did this presentation for them a while ago. Um, wrong. Yep, I apologize, I guess I put the wrong color on that. Um, ISACA and ISD Squared are both information security professional organizations. They have different designations. Um, I'm told that the hardest designation is the CISSP to get, but uh, ISACA has the CISM, which is a manager for IT security, and CISA, which is an auditor's function. So uh, if you can get those, they might be able to help you as well. And, and you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this to you, and half my family is on the job as police. Uh, I'm the black sheep because I went private sector. Right? <laughs> so they laugh at me. They say, well, you don't have a pension. Okay. You don't have a pension to make a million dollars unless you steal it. I, mean, I don't want the debt. <laughs> <laughs> so the bottom line really is, is that you, know, you give and take. But that being said, and, and the point that I'm making is that my, my nephews and my family members don't go to meetings outside of law enforcement. So I said to him, well, why don't you come to ASIS, or why don't you come to the certified fraud examiner? Get to know some people before you retire. 
because then you might be able to get a job or a certification in the interim. So my recommendation to anybody who's serious about being a professional and making extra money or more money, go to chapter meetings, even if it's once every other month. Go to the meetings, meet people, right? Find a mentor. Somebody is smarter than me. Thank God I ran into them, and they taught me my business, and that's why I haven't lost the case in 35 years. Okay. Knock on wood. Uh, or, or mentor a student yourself. There's got to be some student out there. I do 15 students right now. Some of them are Rutgers, one of them is a high school student, which I mentioned earlier. The Rutgers student is in Dalbert's class, um, actually owns two businesses. You know, these are good kids. These are highly motivated. Uh, so, but they could always use, and I actually met this young man for about two hours when he just talked, and he asked me about business. And I said, well, if you think you need $100,000, you better go in with 200000 that's the way business is. You never know what all the expenses are. Join a committee inside there and network. Networking, here's what I teach the students. Motivation, motivation. You gotta love what you do. If you don't love what you do, you're gonna be miserable the rest of your life. How many of us are miserable? Uh, no, few honest people, very few honest people in the room. Thank you. Uh, okay, motivation, uh, enthusiasm, whatever you wanna call it. Education, on the street, or whether it's in the class, I have a friend of mine who owns a computer business. He's had it for 15 or 20 years now. He graduated high school. He's tinkering with computers. Today, he's writing software in Linux. And he's actually going to get out there in the next couple of months and uh, promote this and make some money out of it. My nephew went to college for two weeks, came back. He owns a million dollar firm. Okay, doing computer work again. And by the way, if you're not aware of it, uh, Gates dropped out of Harvard how many times? Never got a degree, as far as I know. Okay? So you don't need to be the smartest person in the world. You do need to be the most motivated. Motivation, education, certification is the next one. How many of us are CFEs? Okay, almost all of you. Good. Uh, it's a great designation. Uh, I've, I've had it for years, decades actually. Uh, and uh, when I walk into a room, there's a difference. Senior executives treat me different. They say, You're a fraud examiner? Yes, I am. How do you do that? <laughs> it was a fraud. I don't know what to do. <laughs> anyhow, the point is that having the certification makes a difference. And then the key, the last thing I'll tell you, if you don't have all of that, network. If you network, and I'm, you know, I've done work for uh, uh, some of the student groups in the area, just talking to them, they're from all over the world, you never know where your next opportunity is coming from. And I used to, when I had my first company, I used to hire from Rutgers and Jersey City University, internships, undercover operations, surveillance operations, some of the brightest minds I've ever worked with, and multilingual. Okay. I tried my best <laughs> to stretch it out as long as I could, Carl. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Frank. Show us the money, Frank. Oh, you want to see them? Yeah. yeah. We got <laughs> Show them the money. Show them the money. Show them the money. Remember, please complete your evaluation. Go along. At the end of the day, we're going to give you an evaluation. We're going to give you a certificate. It's going to have your name on it. Don't grab any certificate. If you do that, if you send an email, we've got it. I had to go through this once before. Uh, we're going to take about two years to get to your certificate. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go through this pretty quick. All right, so um, you guys have probably read this. $3.7 trillion globally in 2013. So let's see what this, let's see what trillion dollars actually looks like. So you know why we have only a $100 bill in the United States? Money laundering. Money laundering and one more thing. North Korea and, well actually, Iran received two of our printing presses, and when we print American money, it's through uh, offset printing and taglia printing. And they had two machines. When the Shah fell, they started. They said, "Well, how are we going to get back to the U.S.?" Remember what I talked about about economics? They started printing what later on became known as the Super One Hundred Dollar Bill. Nobody could tell. And some of the women who work in the banks, they can feel the money and know it's wrong, but nobody could tell the difference. That's why they changed the bill. When I bought my first car, I bought it with a $1,000 bill and a $100 bill. There are no thousands. That's the largest denomination we have. Okay. Um, 
That's what 10,000 looks like, half inch thick. This is what a million looks like. Fit in your backpack, right? And, and if anybody has a backpack with that, please tell me, I'll be happy to guard it for you. Uh, if you want to make a million dollars, $300 a week for 64 years and five weeks. Okay, anybody want to make 300 a week? No, my kid does that mowing lawns. Uh, this is what four foot by four foot by four foot of $100 bills. This is a pallet, a standardized pallet. $100 million. That's what, 300,000 a week. Now that's the job I want. 300,000 a week, 64 years. Here you go, 10 pallets. That's what a billion dollars looks like. You ready for this? This is the breakdown. And if you think theft and fraud doesn't impact on you anywhere in the world, this is based on 7.2 billion people living on the planet, breaking down the amount of money we just discussed. Uh, 3.7 tri trillion. At the bottom line really is, is $113.88 uh, per person per year. And that's probably off because we know about statistics, right? We don't know what the pool was, it probably wasn't broad enough. And so here's what a trillion dollars looks like. You ready? 10,000 pallets of $100 bills. If you pull your truck up to the back of Rogers today, we'll give you a pallet. All right, is that amazing? And just think, that's only one trillion. Anyhow, thank you very much. Sandwiches. Uh, we're going to start lunch 10 minutes early. We'll be back here at 12 30. We hope to have you out here 10 minutes at a schedule. We're going to move up the schedule by 10 minutes. Keep you back. So please go out, enjoy your sit out there. We pretty much run the students off. Uh, <laughs>